Hey everyone, thanks for coming in. It's really great to see you all here. Uh, this is the third lecture in the series of three lectures. Uh, I want to thank uh, Robert for all uh, the effort and time and, and energy you put into this. It's been a really great series. Um, those of you who haven't seen all of the series, RETN will be broadcasting um, all, of the, all of the different segments on their uh, cable, access, uh, cable access channel, channel 16 and um, they'll be posting that on their website, the different error times and such, and I believe we'll also be able to access that through the internet. Um, I hope that we'll be able to put it on Blog Hollow's website as well. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors for this event and for the exhibit itself, uh, our sponsors being VPR, uh, Outdoor Gear Exchange, and of course RETN, who's made all the videoing possible. I'd also like to uh, thank our, our patron sponsor, Fulton Gregg, who, um, whose generosity really made this a uh, reality. With all that said, I'd like to give the mic back over to, uh, to Robert, and he's got the small mic. <laughs> thanks a lot. Well, thanks for coming. Um, uh, what I'm, I, I was, Claude and I were talking earlier today. Uh, I have given talks a lot when I've traveled, especially overseas to potters groups in England, Wales, Ireland, New Zealand, places I've been able to give workshops to. It's kind of unusual for me to actually be speaking to in America about things here because I'm usually talking about America over there. And here I'm, I'm kind of uh, focusing on, uh, on basically just kilns, kiln building and a little bit about the history of kilns uh, on this uh, PowerPoint presentation. So it's the first time through for me, so bear with me and we'll see where it all goes. Okay, so basically I'm gonna give a little, a little quick history of kilns for people who aren't real uh, familiar with clay or, or pottery. Most everybody I'm looking at here is potter, so this is kind of redundant. Um, uh, we'll talk about design and construction. I'll start with my design and construction just because it's what I have the most firsthand knowledge with. And then I'll get into the love of architecture of kilns, which is probably the obscure to most of you, but I really like the architecture of kilns. I, I, I would feel comfortable talking to a group of architects more than anybody else about shapes of kilns and, and, and what's going on with them. Just the basics of, of firing, if you don't know a whole lot about clay, and a lot of people, are actually amazing how many potters I know who know about making pots, but they don't know all the processes about what clay is all about. And I'll go into a little bit about history in that the earliest kilns were really nothing more than bonfires. Uh, this is an African one. I took it out of a book. Uh, actually, it was uh, uh, Daniel Rhodes' kiln book, if you're familiar with that. That was the Bible for our generation. Um, but basically, they would just basically stack their pots up, build a fire outside of it, build a bonfire on top of it. You can get to about 1,300 degrees at that temperature, and you'd chemically change the clay, clay, which is basically de degraded rock, into a, into a crystalline silica uh, of structure that is no longer clay. So you can't grind up a pot and have clay anymore from it. Um, Native American uh, basically did the same thing. Before Europeans came, there was no glazed pottery on this continent. Mayas, Incas, uh, Anastasi, uh, there were no glazed vitrified clay in, this, in, the, in, the, in the Americas before Europeans. They had some pretty dense pots because they would polish them, but they would not be watertight. Even their water containers would slowly seep moisture out. So if you filled up a three gallon latilla out, after a day or two, you may have lost a quart of water to evaporation, which is kind of handy in a hot climate because it keeps it cool. But they would slowly seep. Um, the, this particular Native American, if you're familiar with Maria Martinez or anybody familiar with the black on black wear, she basically built a bonfire on top of her pots and then smothered it with, with cow manure and then dirt in order to create a lot of carbon and then she got these jet black pots, which were very famous for the uh, Santa Clara potters. Uh, this is a different Pueblo, and she was doing more of the uh, pattern designs, and they wanted to do oxidized firing. So actually, I'll go back one. They were actually using bed springs to protect the pots so they wouldn't be touched exactly by the fuel. She's stacking up cow dung or horse manure against them, sat, laying that on fire, and then as soon as the fire would burn down, the pots got hot enough that they would be hardened. She pulled all of that away and she wouldn't get the blackening on it. So when you see that really decorative wear, that was oxidized firing. But again, low fire, none of this stuff exceeded about 14 to 1600 degrees. This is kind of the next generation of kilns. This was actually taken by somebody we met in New Zealand, Peter Stitchberry, who worked with uh, Michael Cardew years ago. I found it in a book and it really kind of killed me because I, I didn't look at his name until I'd already taken a photograph and thought, well, this is a, 
kind of like a half kiln. They've actually started to create a structure, but nothing was built on top of that. They basically took broken pottery shards, put it over top of all those pots, and then started a fire on top of that, not unlike a bonfire. So it's sort of the next stage of getting pots from a bonfire to a semi-enclosed structure to where we get to where kilns are that we think of today. And that's most of what my talk is all about. So they would have basically put broken pottery shards over that to kind of create a, a shell, start a fire on top of that slow enough that hopefully it didn't blow up the pots. Get, they threw straw on top, which burns really fast and hot. And then they'd open it up afterwards and that's, they're, they're actually unloading that at that point. That's, that's in India. Um, so my personal three things I'm talking about on kilns have to do with, I used to think of kilns as a tool to convert you know, clay to pottery or to, or to ceramic structure, uh, sculpture. Uh, I'm using kilns for surface effect. And I, I, I was, we were talking before, I, I didn't even have a photograph of an electric kiln in here. I probably should have just to be complete about kilns, but I'm really looking for the kiln to be my decorating technique, which is why I built so many different kilns and why I'll be kind of going into the, into the, uh, the designs of the kilns that I'm working with now. And the third thing that I kind of, my personal views on kilns are, I really perceive them as, as, as beautiful structures. They don't have to be beautiful. And I've visited some of the god-awful, ugliest kilns you've ever seen that fired beautiful pots. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the Anagama kilns are, just look like holes in the ground you know, with dirt piled on top of them. But they fire pots great. But I, I do like the structures. So uh, for the past 20 years or so, I've been potting now for 40 years. But for the past 20 years, I've really been kind of working a lot with different kinds of kilns. I'm standing in my big, my big local, my big current wood kiln now, and that's the smaller wood kiln, which, is, which uh, has been replaced by the larger one. Um, so a little bit of kiln history at my studio, which I'll go through quickly because I want to talk about other potters more than that. Um, one of my early gas-fired kilns in, in my studio where I am now was a two-chamber. There's a chamber behind that I, I exhausted through. Using gas, I was running my gas exhaust from my glazing chamber through a secondary chamber so I could get a free bisque out of it. At least that was the theory of it. Uh, I actually wrote an article in um, Ceramic Review in England thinking I was so smart at age 22 that I was going to tell people all this new stuff. Um, and it was partly successful. You know, the, the second chamber never got past about 1100. But, but the idea was there, I could reuse my waste heat even in a gas kiln. Um, but I was pr primarily using you know, gas firing as a way to vitrify ware to get to the higher temperatures. Uh, that kind of moved into a second generation of gas kilns at my studio, which is a car kiln. Uh, that kiln is now gone. I, I tore that down about seven or eight years ago. Um, but at the time, I was primarily making the water sculptures. And I, I was not so much concerned then with reduction because what I was doing was wanting a consistency of firing with no glazes. So I actually, even though I was firing gas, and a lot of potters kind of think of gas kilns as being more interesting than electric kilns, I would have been better off firing with electric because I was looking for a kiln that didn't have flashing and reduction patches in it because my water, I didn't want half of an aquarium to be red flashed with reduction marks and the other half to be uneven. The same thing with, the, with the, uh, the fountains. I wanted a consistency to those. So my gas reduction kiln in the 70s and the 80s was primarily uh, a, a neutral or an oxidizing atmosphere. Uh, this is the replacement for that last kiln, which is the one I'm firing now. Um, I've gotten a little smarter over the years, and now I have 13 inches of insulating brick walls, so this thing really heats up easily. Uh, and more so, it really cools slowly. So I'm able to get glaze results, not because I'm smart, but because I'm lucky in that I now have a kiln that cools so slowly, I get a whole different look to the wares I have now with the same glazes that I was using you know, 10 years earlier. Uh, and the, the gas reduction kiln I'm, I'm using now, 80% of why I'm using it is for bisking. Uh, I'm primarily, my heart is in wood and, and, and salt glazing. Uh, but I do bisque all my pots. And most of the wood fire pots I know do not uh, bisque their work before they wood fire. Uh, they're trying to save time and energy, so they green glaze and they do a once fire wood firing. I just never got the technique down for green glazing, although my aquariums were always green glazed. I just brushed the glaze on the inside. But for doing pots, I, I could never quite get that down. So I, I bisque fire in that kiln sometimes 12, 14 times a year. 
That'll produce two or th maybe 2,000 bisque pots that I then store, which then get fired usually in my uh, wood or my uh, salt kilns. But I do copper reds in the gas kiln because I get more control out of that. I can't get that kind of control in the, in the wood kiln at all. Um, other, other kilns that I'm using in my studio, uh, which are really primitive, are basically the, like the bonfire kilns we were talking about before. The one advantage we have, we're just basically taking dry clay pots, polishing them to get a, a dense surface to it so that when the flames lick the pot, the flames have copper in them, it'll stain the pieces. So we're actually, we call it flame painting, but basically the fire is what's doing the decoration. So I'm basically brushing on uh, terra sigillata, fancy name for liquid clay, polishing the pieces up, bedding them down in sawdust to get some carbon trapping, and uh, putting some copper sulfate around them, which then fumes, and then you get blushes of red and other colors on the pieces, and that's the effect you end up getting. The trouble with pit firing, and I'll talk about raccoon next, is neither one of those are high fire techniques. They basically are non-vitreous clay. I mean, they're not watertight. Uh, even with the glaze on them, there's a chance with cracks in the glaze or crackle glazes that the pieces are going to seep. Um, we always put a sticker on the bottom of these pots when we sell them saying no water contact. And you know, that's, that doesn't work always. You know, you, you people are never read everything. But uh, they will seep if they uh, uh, have or are filled with water. And we wax the outsides of these pieces to enhance the color and also to kind of protect the finish to some extent. I do know potters who will wax the inside with beeswax or they'll use Thompson's water seal to try to make them watertight. I just look at them as basically pieces of art and, and sell them that way. Um, everybody's a little different on that level, but, but Raku and Pit, like I say, to me are more like art pots, uh, and I don't think of them as being functional. Uh, so I do make things like clocks out of them, so they are functional. So I do a little bit of Raku. Obviously, I'm doing a clear glaze over a white clay body. Rapid cooling, if you don't know what Raku is, you're taking the pots out of the kiln. Rapid cooling fractures the glaze. We then smoke the pots. That creates a lot of carbon that gets wicked into the cracks, and any place the glaze is cracked, it shows up as a black pattern. And one step I just started with a friend, uh, Luke, yeah, Luke, uh, Luke Iannuzzi. Uh, he's, he's known as the Negged Potter, but that's not what he is. Uh, he, he, he does Negged Raku firing. And that's, that's really kind of a cool thing. I did it for the first time this year. You're never too late, old to learn. And, and I had a great time doing it. Basically, this was a bisque pot. I, I burnished the piece, bisque fired it, put a thick layer of clay on it, a slip, um, fired it a second time, the slip cracks, carbon gets through it, and you get essentially a very similar look to a crackle glaze, but it's not even glazed. I mean, how much simpler can you get? There's no glaze. Uh, it's fired to a low temperature. I mean, they're, they're kind of, again, a visually pretty object, but really more of a work of art than what I tend to lean toward, which is vitrified stoneware, which gets me into where my life is today. Um, another, another firing technique we're using, the one we're using more of, is wood firing. And uh, it gets a little more esoteric in terms of the colors oftentimes aren't as bright as you get in lower temperatures. They're certainly not as bright as you get in pit firing and maybe not as dramatic as you get in raku. But uh, to most potters, it's often referred to as potter's pots, because you get these effects on the pots that read about the process that we find so interesting in, you know, in that com potter's community. Uh, the pot on the right here has gotten uh, a, a line of flashing. It was sort of sitting on a bag wall, and between two bricks, the fire went and laid a, 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 a stream of ash onto the form. Um, so it's about subtlety. So, the, so you start to get to this pyramid where less and less people find the pieces as interesting, and it's all as potters at the top and a half a dozen collectors. And that's sort of, unfortunately, the world I'm living in now because it's what I love doing, but the pots you know, have a little less drama associated with them. Uh, again, a couple more ash-like effects from wood firing, uh, no glaze at all, just ash and flash. And uh, I mentioned this in one of the other uh, talks, but I'll, I'll mention it again. Um, this, the pot on the right here, this was, this was actually came out of my uh, wood kiln, but it was uh, 
sitting on wadding, which keeps the pot from fusing to the kiln shelf. If you don't know what the firing process is like in wood and salt, uh, the wood ash coming in from the flames has a fluxing action. So if you have pots in the kiln with no glaze on the pots, uh, the ash hitting the pot can actually create a glaze, and you'll, you get a glazed finish, or at least a sheen to it. But the kiln shelves, which are made out of silicon carbide or some kind of a clay material, also get glazed. And if you don't have separators, things will get fused together, so the wad marks become part of it. Um, I sign my pots in as small letters as I can to be unobtrusive so that the patterning of the process is what I want people to see and recognize. So the wad marks are there. My, my, I trim kind of really roughly, and, and I like leaving the trim marks. I leave that in there, and I, and I will then stamp all my pieces with a potter's chop, which is a stylization of one of my fountain designs, which I do when the pots are leather hard. So, so most all my pots have the chop on them. The bigger pots, or the ones that are a little more important, I do sign. I tend not to sign mugs and things I do lots of, but just too much time for what they are. Um, so, I did have a salt gas kiln, which burned out after about 10 firings or 15 firings. I saw it really heavily, and I built this kiln out of insulating fire brick, which was great in terms of holding the kiln in, holding the heat in, but insulating fire brick, if you know what, well, we'll talk about bricks in a minute, are very porous, and they give great insulation. They're wonderful to, to fire with, but they also will absorb sodium and kind of just dissolve from the inside out. Uh, uh, so for a, a number of years, I fired a gas. This is an Olson fast fire wood kiln that I converted to gas and um, did salt glazing in that. That really got my heart going with salt glazing. And then I eventually moved on to a much uh, more appropriate salt kiln, which is really a test kiln for me. Uh, this is up the hill from my larger wood kiln. It's big enough that I can fire 40, 50, 60 pots at a time and test out ideas in salt, how much salt to put in, where to, where to stack the pots. Uh, I'm using a lot of washes these days. I try not to put glazes on too many of the salt pots I, I fire. Again, if you're not familiar with salt glazing, I'll quickly go over the aspect that instead of dipping the pot in a mineral bath that when heated turns into a glaze, you're putting pots in usually with no glaze on the pot and then throwing sodium in the form of soda ash or, or uh, uh, bicarbonate of soda, or in my case, sodium chloride salt, uh, which vaporizes and the sodium in the fire acts as a flux. And when it hits the clay, the silica in the clay actually turns into a glass. So you're actually etching the pot and dissolving the surface of it. And that's essentially what's happening with this piece. I mean, that pot was heavily salted. There are potters I know who put like, in a kiln that size, they might put a pound of salt and they get a nice little sheen to their pot. You know, I'm putting in 18 pounds and I get really juicy pots and my kilns melt away. So uh, I, I pay the price in the kiln because I want that effect. And that's, I, don't, I haven't figured out any way of, of you know, not having a cause and effect uh, you know, making the kilns wear out quickly, at least the way I'm, I'm working with it these days. So the salt patterns that I, I, I'm looking for tend to be much more heavy. There's uh, as many names for salt as there are Eskimos talking about snow. You know, your wet snow and dry snow and big flakes and small flakes. And salt glazing has the same thing. You have, you have like orange, uh, orange peel, which would kind of be related to there. This is a little bit more like onion skin. There's all kinds of different textural effects you get from it. A lot of potters who are doing soda firing or doing light salt firing have a sheen to the outside of the pots. It's very beautiful. It's just an effect that I'm not personally looking for as much. So I'm salting a lot heavier, so I'm wearing my kilns out faster. Uh, again, the wad marks become uh, a, a, a byproduct of the process, but they're also something you gotta think, I think about as part of the design process. So again, talking about kilns being the firing process, but also being the process that decorates for it, even what you put the pots on for wadding becomes kind of important. And there are certain potters who won't use what they, what they call this, you know, the, I call bird dew because it's so white, the clay body is really white. They, they don't like that, so they'll, they'll mix like, uh, oh, um, clay mixed with, um, coffee grounds and, and sawdust to make it really porous so it kind of breaks off and you don't get that white mark, you get a, a more subdued uh, look. The trouble with that is, is that clay turns into a glass as a material and it's a little bit harder to come off with. I'm using primarily for wadding, I'm using 
50% aluminum hydrate and 50% clay. For those of you who do salt glazing, Michelle knows. Uh, that, that stuff always comes off. You know, you, you don't have to worry about it. Um, I'm, I'll show a couple of kilns of other potters. Mick Casson was a really well-known potter. Again, I don't know how many people know who he was. He was a well-known Welsh potter. He was like Mr. Salt Clays in, in um, uh, Wales. He was firing a kind of an under firebox, wood-fired salt kiln, and uh, also had a separate salt kiln that he had these gas burners that he fired in. So he was using wood and gas. Karen Carnes, if people must know who Karen Carnes is, uh, she once said to me that she thought the most beautiful pots were wood-fired pots that were salt glazed. I don't have the eye for it. I can't hard, I mean, the salt to me, especially where I'm using it, so overwhelms the wood ash, I can't tell whether my pots were put in, a, in my gas salt kiln or my wood salt kiln because the salt is so heavy, it kind of obliterates what light ash there might have been in there. But, uh, but Mick was doing it both ways as well. Um, and industrially, just kind of salt glazing. We've all probably seen these silos in Vermont that have these kind of checkerboard textures. I don't know if you've ever been up to one. I've been up to a couple and asked the farmers if I could take pieces of them away as they fall down. But they're basically an extruded tile, uh, about three inches thick, about yay big, with holes that go all the way through them. And they're nothing but big tiles that have been salt glazed. And that's how a lot of silos were built in the 1940s and 1950s. And uh, with wire bands around them, they're slightly canted. They, they created these wonderful silage uh, towers that were quite resistant to acid, which is what salt glazing is. Uh, so they were really very commonly used. You can see the outer course here of the, uh, it's, a, it's a hollow walled form, has broken through and you can see the inside of that one. The big pot to the right was, actually I grew up in southern New Jersey, uh, way south, like beyond where the turnpike ends. And a farmer across the road, well not, well not across the road, but not far from where I lived, had two of these big pots in front of his yard. And I stopped by one day just to ask him if I could photograph them and uh, talk to him a little bit. Uh, there's a stamp on them that says 19, 1913. It's sort of from Germany, just, just prior to the war, I guess. And they were being brought over by DuPonts uh, and they had dyes in them. They essentially were disposable containers. These big, giant, beautiful salt pots were dumped in the Delaware River after they took the dye out of them. So at some point, you could dredge the Delaware and probably find hundreds of these things. Um, brick making kilns, and I'm, I, I want to go through brick making kilns because they, as objects, really appeal to me. The earliest brick making kilns really weren't much more than stacks of bricks stacked up with some air intakes underneath that wood was fired through and incredibly uneven in temperature. The, the, the innermost bricks would be fired hot, the outer ones were just one step away from being clay, but that was the earliest brick making types of kilns. Um, I just love beehive kilns. This one was in Essex Junction. Anybody who lives in Essex may, may or may not know of the brickyard condominiums. If you've heard or heard of that, well, those were the, why they called it the brickyard condominiums. There were four of those really big kilns there in the early 70s. I took photographs of them just a year before they tore them down. They were just gorgeous structures. They, I think there's a chimney left there now, but that's about all there is. And Densmore Brickyards, all the buildings at the um, 40th and Allen were built out of Densmore bricks that were made there in Essex Junction. But this is essentially what the downdraft uh, beehive kilns were. They, all the, the drafts would be in the floor. Uh, you'd have fireboxes surrounding the exterior of this. They were either fired with coal or, if available, gas that would be fed in. And then the flames would come up and they'd be drawn out through a floor vent and then go out to a chimney. In Densmore, over in uh, Essex Junction, they had one chimney with like five different kilns feeding into it underground. So it was like there was a warren of of tunnels underground that you could uh, excavate and, and see all going to a similar chimney. Um, this was one that was, uh, we have a friend down in Virginia we were visiting, and this was actually in a park, but it was about an hour from a, a prison called the Lorton Prison and was built by the prisoners, this is classic, uh, to, to make bricks to build their prison out of. Uh, but, and they tore down all the other ones, but that one beehive kiln was left, and it's actually in really wonderful condition. It's the only one that I've ever seen that actually has railroad tracks going into it, so they could actually roll the bricks into it in order to load the bricks into the kiln without having to hand carry them in. That was a, a kind of one of an interesting effect for me. 
But um, a few years ago, Chris and I had heard about some bricks over in um, West Lebanon, just across you know, the river. Uh, and actually, when you go across the river, they're almost on the banks of the Connecticut. And there were five or six of these kilns there, and there's no trespassing signs and fences and all that. And, and the, uh, but that's all kind of falling apart. It's right next to um, Comcast has a, has a power plant there. So if you wanted to kind of go back there, I don't think anybody's going to arrest you. Uh, but they, there was about five or six of these kilns. These two were, were left intact. Most of them are just broken down now. Again, they were also Densmore Bricks companies over there. I happened to be in Salt Lake a number of years ago. I, I work on a ranch for, for my recreation. And I was with my buddy, and we were driving back from the ranch, and we saw these beehive kilns, which I assumed were defunct. There were five big ones there. And I got Denny, my buddy, to say, hey, it was a Sunday, actually. I said, let's pull over and see if I can kind of climb in there and take some photographs of them. It turns out not only were they not defunct, they were all in operation. There were five of them, and they were all in the process of either being loaded, cooled, or fired. And, you know, by the time, I didn't have to re-break in, but I kind of knocked on the door, and the, the night watchman was there, and he said, oh, sure, I don't care, look around. So I took photographs of, of these kilns. So you can see stacks of bricks, you know, all being shrink-wrapped there, and a series of them. These were originally probably fired with coal, but they've all been converted to natural gas now. But that's what you look at when you look up into the ceiling of these things. They're just cathedral ceilings. I just love beehives, just for the, just the, for the visual structures of insides of them. And you can see how the bricks were stacked. Again, gaps between them to let air flow so you get a more even heating uh, of uh, the real density. When you're firing bricks, you're talking about a lot of mass in there. Unlike potter's kilns where most of the mass is the kiln shells, you know, in these things, this is a lot of mass. Um, this is another brick making kiln that Chris and I saw, I think around 2002. Thereabouts, I forget what year it was. Uh, we'd heard about it through other Potter friends over there. I've given a number of workshops in New Zealand, and it's called a Hoffman kiln. And this this is a real hoot as, of, a, of a design of a kiln. It uh, that's that that was it. They stopped firing bricks there in 1950, and that's a, a view of it when it still had a chimney. But what it is is essentially, if you can imagine a horse track inside, but covered over, so it's one tunnel that is, is non-stop. That's what the Hoffman kiln is. And each one of those openings you see is a doorway, but it's also uh, a firing port and, a, and, a, uh, and an exit port. And uh, I'll just go a couple more shots of the architecture of it. But they're just wonderful. Like it just will go around, come back on itself. I think it had 14 doors. And there is, this isn't of the Hoffman kiln. I took this out of a book. But you can kind of see what would happen was they would be firing with fuel here, that would be preheating the next chamber. That would, that would you know, get that to a, a, a temperature where it was as maximum ising. That would, that would, now it was done, it was, it was heated to maximum temperature. That was, they would be drawing out now uh, the, uh, uh, the bricks that were finished and, and the cool air would be preheating for the next one. So they, they could actually be constantly loading firing and loading and firing in two different places with this. So this kiln would go nonstop for, they, they would talk about going nonstop for nine months at a time, making a thousand bricks a day. So people would wear these heavy, thick gloves because they're taking them out when they're really hot and um, constantly um, changing the direction of preheated air, getting the dry bricks drier before they got to the maximum temperature and then the cold air cooling it off and then you start the whole prying process again. Um, just a few more shots of the Hoffman. It's just, it was just a marvelous kiln. Um, all the, the holes you see in the, in, the, in the ceiling would have vented up into the upper structure of that and in which case would then go off into a central flue. It was, it was kind of a convoluted kiln, a little hard to understand in photographs, but, but really beautiful structures. And this was actually fired with, I found this in a, we bought a book on, from, from a guy who was a historian there. This was actually fired with natural gas. They had natural gas uh, pumps that they would pump gas into this thing for. Uh, what was on the top of that? Did well, it that's why it's not too hard to see. Is essentially uh, above this was, uh, there was a flue that ran down the whole length of it. The chimney's gone in this photograph. 
they, they stopped firing this, they, they tore the chimney down in like 1955. So at the end of it, there had been a chimney, but above this, there was sort of like a central flue that the gases would go up into and then vent down to the chimney. And as, as they would basically be unloading bricks here, you know, uh, as they cooled, this would be getting fired off over here and, and you'd be loading bricks in here, which would then be getting preheated. So you're constantly like loading bricks, where you're unloading bricks, while they're still quite hot, you're putting bricks in here, which has been emptied because you've emptied these already, and you're preheating those with the air that's coming through. A, a, a burner here now is bringing that temperature up higher, and by the time you get to the backside, you're at maximum temperature and they do it again. So there's two places in this kiln that you were loading and unloading at the same time. Well, I guess that, but that's a wooden structure. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's, it's all masonry underneath. It really looks weird. Do, are there offices or? Yeah, <laughs> or let, let me go backwards, just a quick one, to see if, that you can see that that's more masonry on top there. But they have windows, so. Yeah, I know, again, it's, 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 not, it's not all kiln up there. There's like a tube on top of the kiln it's like this racetrack inside where the kilns are being fired. They go into flues that fed up, and then the whole length of the building had this collection chamber that ran down the length of it. And then they had a whole series of different dampers you could open and close as you were heating or cooling different chambers. It just, they were just marvelous structures. I mean, again, I'm really hung up on architecture, and this is one of the more interesting architectures that I've seen. There was a few of these in England as well, and there was another name for them other than Hoffman, but this was uh, one that Chris and I, again, the structures were just, just gorgeous to look into. So that's brick making, and that kind of just ties in real briefly with that domed structure that I'm kind of in, in, enthralled with. Uh, Merrick's music was a, a potter that Chris and I met in 90, I guess I met him in 91 or 90, yeah, 91, I guess we met him. Uh, and he was in his 70s then. Uh, he was like Mr. Salk Lays in New Zealand, but he had two beehive kilns that he had an underground flue that connected to a chimney with. Um, the, the scale of beehives don't work so well when they're small, just by the nature of the fact that you're, you're dealing with square shelves and a round structure and you end up with a lot of voids, but they were just beautiful objects. Um, that's just another shot of, of Merrick's kiln. He was, when we met him, he had already stopped firing these, these they're actually a part of the national treasure. He's, it's on a national registry in New Zealand as being one of these things that they hope they'll, they'll maintain forever as objects. But Merrick had built a little sprung arch salt kiln when we were there. And he didn't know we were there. I mean, in New Zealand, everything's a little loose. And we were just kind of wandering around his place. And his studio was open. We were walking through his, his shop. And, and we heard him going, oh, wow. <laughs> And you, you, you know, he, was, he was using gloves and, and towels to take his pots out of the kiln because he couldn't wait to see what they look like. This guy's 70 years old, he's been firing pots for 50 years, and he still couldn't wait. And he was covering them up with towels because you could hear them pinging, you know? It was like they were just too hot to, uh, to he could not wait. Uh, and that's just who Merrick is, he's such, he was such an interesting guy. And that kiln was so falling apart that he had actually built columns of brick inside to help hold the arch up because the arch had now almost collapsed. And Merrick said, I'm firing this kiln for the last time now. Well, actually I've said that for 23 times now, but he'd been firing this kiln for the last time for 23 times. He said, it looks, the pots look so good now. All his bricks are glazed. All the sodium goes into the, the process of, of working on the clay rather than the bricks. Uh, of course you got, bricks falling from the ceiling now, and you got chunks falling in the pots, and you lose a lot more pieces, but that was sort of typical of, of Merrick. Um, Jane Harold is a potter uh, who lives in, Palisades. in Palisades, New York. Um, she was the last person to train with Michael Cardoop before, it's actually she was training with him when he passed away. Uh, and she's the only other person I know around here who built a round kiln. Jack Troy wrote a book on kiln building, and um, on salt glazing, I guess it was, and he used Jane's kiln as the sample for a, a round beehive kiln. But again, it had, I think it had uh, five fireboxes on it, and the diameter of it was, wasn't much more than my arm span. It was a lot of work to fire, but it, you know, she, she kind of grew up with Michael Cardew's influence and really wanted that kind of a structure. And 
that's what she fires in. Um, staying with sort of primitive kilns, was, if any of you have been to Sturbridge Railway, you've seen this one, classic beehive. Really, that would be bottle. bottle. Thank you, Chris. Chris. Chris knows me better than myself. Uh, classic bottle kiln. I mean, uh, it's, it's really just one step above a bonfire. I probably should have had this way much earlier in it. But uh, the interesting thing from a structural standpoint of being a kiln builder is you're not building any kind of an arch. You're basically just stepping in the bricks a little bit as you go up, so you don't really have to have any kind of form to, to structure it with, but you do need to band it, because as you heat it and the bricks expand, the whole thing is gonna move out. And if you don't have something to contain it, they move out, but they don't come back in again. That's one of the things about, you know, expansion out, if you, if you, you know, it can expand out to a certain point and then cool it or come back a little bit. But if it keeps expanding out, the whole thing is gonna collapse. So you have to have metal bands around that. And you'll see the same thing on those uh, salt kilns I showed earlier. They all had metal bands holding that dome in place. Without that, uh, you know, there was all the, the thrust was going to be going outward. Um, so this is the first or the earliest form of high fire kiln. I was starting out with sort of like bonfires being the early, earliest form of getting clay turned into pottery. Um, that only got you to basically a non-vitreous or, or a non-water tight temperature, 13, 1600 degrees. Basically, think red clay flower pots. Uh, the earliest bank kilns or cave kilns, anagama means cave kiln or bank kiln, depends on how I translate it, um, were basically potters would mine clay in a hillside and they dug their clay in up through the ground, this is all one big clay bank, and so all the walls are clay naturally. So essentially they dug a cave in, in a pile of clay, and they used the clay to make pots with, but now they had a clay-lined hole that became the kiln, and that's the earliest form of high-fire kiln that would get to a vitreous temperature. Um, so the trouble with the, on, with the earliest bank caves was that your fire here was very hot, obviously. So you had you know, quite hot vitreous pots here and much less so in the back. Um, that, that style of kiln, the onagama, would evolve into, uh, this is actually uh, made for ungi pots in, in um, Korea, but the same idea. It was an underground kiln, but now they, they brought part of it above ground and had stoking ports along the sides of it. Uh, this is actually, the, you know, uh, not the same kiln, but the same design, where they would have stoking ports about every four or five feet. So you'd start the big fire in the front of it, you get it up to the temperature that you're firing to. The ungi pots were probably fired around 2,300 degrees. And then uh, this area might be 2,100 degrees, and you start side stoking there and bring that up to 2,300. So you just kept pushing the heat up in that. By the time you're done firing, you could actually be unloading the bottom of it because you're, you're pushing the heat up the hill. And it's sort of like laying a chimney on its side. You're, you're inducing the draft by the fact that the kiln is at an angle. 22 degrees is technically the best angle for doing that, but that's essentially what the cave or bank kilns were. And, uh, and that's become one of the rages, I mean rages, but it's become very popular in the U.S. in the last 15, 18 years. Uh, or, or as wood firing, especially Anagama style firing. Um, Todd Piker is, a, is a, another Michael Cardew trained potter in Cornwall Bridge, uh, Connecticut. And this was his kiln. This one has collapsed since then. He had a snow load on it a year later and it fell down on the kiln and the whole kiln collapsed. But the, he, he trained a number of people. Uh, Hoyt Barringer at UVM uh, worked with Todd. Um, Jamie McCutcheon, who owns uh, Vermont Gift Barn, if you've never been in Vermont Gift Barn. Uh, Jamie's a potter and uh, he trained uh, at Todd's as well. So he's put out tons of potters uh, as apprentices. He has a two-year apprentice program. And when you leave uh, Todd's, you know how to throw. And oftentimes the potters that left him opened their own potters quite successfully uh, in a similar style of work. Um, he also, as you can see in Todd's back of his kiln, did tile work. And just you can see how many tiles he stacked up in, in the back of his uh, tube kiln. The Paul Shaleff's another potter. Um, again, both uh, Todd and Paul had essentially what I call a straight tube. It's more like a railroad tunnel. I mean, it, it didn't have any kind of bell shape to it. Um, 
having it half underground would help support the outward thrust of the arch on these. That's one of the reasons for half burying these onagamas was you could actually use earth as your, your buttressing device and as your insulation device. Didn't always work and we have a potter in New Zealand we can kind of show you how that didn't work for him so well. On. This was Hoyt and Nancy. Hoyt's teaching at UVM now. Uh, he, and he fired a kiln up in uh, Lake Elmore for, I'm guessing, six or seven years before you know, life changed for them and they came down here. Um, the interesting thing about this kiln for me, uh, for, which I thought was a, a unique idea that he had, was this is the, the um, you can't see the very beginning of it, but this is essentially where you load the kiln from. And it's going at, uphill at a slight angle. This is the top end of the kiln the flue actually goes underground and this is the chimney. So you could actually load from both ends of his kiln because you could un open the back of the kiln and open the front of the kiln and load from both ends so you didn't have to climb all the way up or climb all the way down. I thought that was in ingenious as hell and uh, I I'd never seen it on anybody else's kiln before. He, he seems to have done the self-supporting arch. I don't know the technical name for that, but Can't that's the arch that, that puts no outward pressure. That's a catenary arc. Catenary arc, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 and actually I'll, 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 I'll do that part of it here. Um, so again, uh, that's sort of the inside of, of Hoyt's kiln. It is a catenary arch, and I, actually I'll show you a, a slide that kind of explains what catenary arches are. Lots of different ways of building arches, and the two that I'll really talk about are sprung arches and catenary arches because they're the most common ones. Um, this was an onagama of Sven Baer in, in England and had just a beautiful taper to it. This is more like a flame-shaped kiln that kind of came in and, and would taper down on the back. They were really beautiful. Um, I, I don't know Sven real well. I've met him a few times. Uh, but, you know, he built this really big kiln, had m pretty reasonable success with it, but then built a much smaller straight tubes one that was easier to fire and he had more consistent results in. I, I think we, Sven and I, in some respects, fall into this love of structure. Uh, regardless of how functional they may or may not be. And that first one of his didn't fire, from my understand, from talking to him and other people, nearly as well as a smaller one did, which was more of a straight tube for him. Um, I was talking before about structures. This, this was uh, Merrick, uh, Bruce Martin, who was, a, who was one of the first onagama kiln that I know of in New Zealand. Uh, he was one of the early potters there. And he had built his kiln and used earth bank on it, but with a soil that did not take the temperature. So the soil kind of uh, got friable, and you can see his arch is just about down to nothing. So uh, uh, Bruce and his, his wife Estelle, who's passed away now, uh, rebuilt a smaller one, a smaller version of that, which was essentially what we call row arches. Every row of bricks was, they weren't bonded together. So he'd do a row of arches and a row of arches. And it, that's why it sort of has that steppy look that he then put concrete over. It was a, it was a, a nice small kiln for him to have fired. And, and again, according to him, he got you know, great results out of it. Uh, he also had a, a step down, like a lot of potters did. Uh, they would put their fire pit down low and they actually would be standing sort of in a pit that they would feed from. So you were sort of here into the ground and you'd have your wood stacked up and you could feed it that way rather than having to bend over so much, uh, you know, having it uh, raised higher. It's just a different way, a different approach for people who do onagamas. Um, the American onagama is really the groundhog kiln. Um, and essentially, that is a kiln, and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of stretching the truth and trying to make it you know, as simple as I can, uh, uh, as far as you know, making this uh, uh, transition from the Japanese oriental style of kilns to American styles. But basically, the groundhog kiln was an underground kiln, but very shallow, and usually had no shelving in it at all. So they, they may only be three foot high and, and pretty straight. They oftentimes didn't have much of an inclination to them. So potters would basically have no kiln shelves or they'd stack pots rim to rim, foot to foot on it. This happened to be in Jugtown. Um, and you can kind of see how straight the, the kiln was. If you crawled in it, it wasn't really, you only had just enough room to crawl into and people would feed you pots uh, and then you'd stack them in, uh, generally just right on ground level. So um, 
the Anagama, which was essentially a cave kiln or a hole kiln, you know, which evolved to be coming partly out of the ground so you could side stoke it, kind of evolved into Naboragama, which is really a chambered climbing kiln, and where you really kind of segmented each chamber. And it gave you a little bit more control, um, especially if you're going for glaze, where you can kind of have a little bit more control over the exact temperature of each one of the chambers. So this, this is again another book shot, but I, I'll show you a variety of different potter's kilns who are using these, myself included. Um, this would be kind of the dogi, the firebox, and then in theory, this is going up a hillside, and again, at a 22 degree angle, you don't even really need a chimney because the last chamber would be just at the right height for the flames to be going out. So the flames come in, they hit a bag wall, forces the fire up, down, into the next chamber, up, down, into the next chamber, and you just kind of work that fire up. Um, this was, if people are familiar with Bernard Leach, who's now becoming kind of old hat, he's died in 79. Um, he, in St. Ives, uh, this was his Naboragama, which was built, and I, I'm guessing in the early 1930s, uh, late 20s. Muhammad, who was a friend of his, th those of you who know Bernard Leach, he, he's sort of ground zero for the, uh, the, the uh, 20th century studio potter move, movement, movement. I mean, it, industrial relation had taken over and you had Staffordshire and you know, all these China makers in England going on. And Bernard went to uh, uh, Japan. He was really a printmaker and he was trying to actually set up printing presses and under teach printmaking in Japan, found out that he didn't have a, a, a kind of a market for that or, or an ability to, to work into it. Met Hamada, who was doing Raku, and found that he liked painting on Raku, doing decoration on Raku, and became a potter. Well, he had Hamada, who, because he was not a kiln builder himself, he had Hamada come back to England, St. Ives, which is in the lower part of England, and Hamada helped him build his first, uh, which is this kiln, uh, which was a three-chambered Naburagama. Uh, unfortunately, within just a few years of being built, the, the St. Ives kind of grew up around them, and he got pressured into not firing with wood anymore because it was so smoky. And uh, it was only fired with wood from, I'm guessing, uh, maybe eight or ten years before they converted to gas. And that chamber was really, and I'm standing essentially where the firebox's were. You can see all, it was, this was oil fed. Uh, so their blow, uh, air was being blown in and oil was being used in, the, in the, what had been the wood fireboxes. Uh, this is his grandson. Uh, David Leach was, those of you who know much about English pottery, David Leach was really the, the potter. I mean, Bernard was, was sort of the intellectual who really kind of brought it back to uh, the masses in terms of understanding how important a one-man pottery would be. His son, David, who passed away now five, six years ago, I guess, maybe longer, uh, was a masterful potter. Everybody respected David immensely. Not that they didn't respect Bernard, uh, but his son, John Leach, is a real character. He's like, you know, he's fun. Uh, uh, and he has a three-chambered Naburagama that he has built. And, I, and some of the little aspects I really liked about his chambers was he, again, he needed some kind of support for, he yeah, wasn't doing catenaries, he was doing sort of a variation of a sprung arch, but he had the metalwork bent in the shape of his arch. Uh, if you go back, and I will go back, to the Leach kiln, you can just see he's supporting it, you know, structurally with these bands, but Johnny really figured out aesthetically how to kind of make that a, a beautiful transition. And he's firing essentially a brewery box style firebox. Uh, this is looking down in his firebox where you're feeding the wood up here. The air is coming from above and going down and, and up through. Uh, I'm feeding, and most of us who, who fire kilns feed wood onto a grate and the air comes up underneath and goes and carries the fire into the chamber. Brewery boxes kind of work in reverse, but they're kind of handy because they're fairly easy to load and they're almost like self-feeding. You can kind of stack them up and, and run them through that way. We happened to be there in 1998 uh, uh, and uh, Johnny had, had finished firing, I guess he just finished, he was loading, unloading a firing, I guess, when we were there. Um, and he fired one more time after that. And when the firing was done, he had his wood stacked outside here. They'd left a couple of pieces of wood leaning against the, the flue between the chimney and the building. And didn't think about it. The firing was done, everything was fine. The wood caught on fire, burned the shop down. 
Um, and so that that building's gone now. He's rebuilt. Kiln was intact. You know that was not a you know didn't hurt the kiln at all. And fire and the pots came out fine. But he has a thatched roof house there in the back. That's where he lives. And it's amazing that his thatched roofed house didn't burn because he was just feet away from his studio. And the, 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 the talk about bizarreness. We were home about a month, and Karen Carnes up in Morgan, Vermont, had her studio burned down. Uh, from a, a kind of a similar situation. The rafters around, she had finished the firing, the rafters around where her chimney exited the building had dried out over years, and they just finally got to the flash point and the place caught on fire and her whole house and burned, her house was connected to her studio, her house and shop burned down. Uh, I went up with a number of other potters, some of them in the room, uh, and helped tear down that kiln. She decided wood firing, she was older then, uh, wood firing was sort of out and she built a salt kiln since then. Uh, this is Richard Batterham's kiln, and again, anybody who knows English potters at all, Richard Batterham was one of those really quasi-central studio potters, just, just really noted for making good, strong pots. Uh, he was oil firing, a lot of oil firing in England. We found more oil firing there than I've ever seen anywhere else. In this country, it tends to be, most of the potters I've met tended to fire with gas. Their oil tended to be used more frequently. And when I looked in this kiln, and I saw it all shiny inside. I, I said to Richard, I didn't, know, I didn't know you did salt glazing. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. And he goes, I don't do salt glazing, but I'd never fire a dry kiln. And he glazes the inside of all his bricks before he fires because he wants the bricks not to absorb any of these the atmospheric conditions that are either coming off of the glazes or if you're a salt firing potter, the salt would work back onto the pots. But he actually glazed all the inside bricks of his kilns. And, that, and as we traveled around England, we gave like eight workshops there. So we visited lots of different potters. We found that was pretty common there. And I've, I've met a couple of American potters since then who actually do glaze the insides of their chambers now. This is uh, over in... Uh, Southern New Hampshire, John Baymore, if anybody knows who John Baymore is, has Rivers Bend Pottery. And he has a, a little, I guess it's four chambered in the Borogama over there. Uh, the chambers are small, which is typical, more typical of what I've, some of us have been to Japan a lot more than others. But uh, the, the chambers, uh, oftentimes they are pretty small. They're like four or five feet high. And, and that's more of what John's is. Uh, I, I kind of went the other route for other reasons. Uh, but that's John. Uh, at, he had already finished his firing, but he was kind enough to go out and kind of show us around how he was firing his kiln. He fired salt in his last chamber and did traditional glaze wear in the first couple of chambers. Um, then you get into the, the, the weirdness of, 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 of Noborogama. There's a Bizen Noborogama, and it's kind of really, this is kind of like, I call it the Swiss Army knife of, of wood kilns, because you have like, I think he had five chambers, and they were all built in this most obscure way of having, you know, a big firebox that led into a certain chamber that went into a very small chamber that connected to another chamber that was bigger. And basically what's happening is he's moving his gases around at different velocities. You know, he has a big chamber, he heats everything up evenly, and then everything exits there like it's going out to a chimney. And he puts pots in there, it's called a secret chamber, where the flames going through there are with such intensity, they produce a certain uh, uh, directional f fire flow that is sort of one kind of look to it. And then that would go into another chamber and he would salt the back chamber of it. Um, so uh, he now actually, I'm not sure Michael's even making pots anymore, but he did open a, a restaurant in Stockbridge, Massachusetts called Bizen. So if you're ever in Stockbridge, Massachusetts and you want Japanese food, um, you know, he has uh, a Bizen restaurant there and the plates you eat off of are his plates, which are, if these plates are pretty, pretty rustic if you know what Bizen wears like. It, it's a lot like a piece of concrete in terms of texture. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I've talked to people from Japan who, who and I, I kind of got an understanding for the, 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 not just the philosophy of it, but you know, as Americans, we're all used to eating with forks and we you know, eat dinner. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if, you have a, uh, if you're eating with chopsticks and you have a shiny plate and you're trying to chase a piece of rice across the plate, on a shiny plate, that's one thing. If you have a dry surface, it's a lot easier actually to grab things. So there, there's logic to some of the texture of things, not just the history of it, but also there's a functionality depending upon whatever culture you come from. Um, and again, this is just some more shots of, of the little, uh, of his Bizen Borgama, multiple flues going out, which went into his, um, 
secret chamber. And I'm, again, I'm always totally intrigued by arches. And uh, I'll, I'll get into arch designs more, but, but the patterning of arches I find really interesting. And a lot of potters I know now are actually doing castable arches, which make a lot of sense. You build a form, you pour the stuff on top. You've got, you know, you got a monolithic arch and it's really stable. But you know, the aesthetic kind of is lost on me there. Um, Matt Jones is a potter in North Carolina. We visited a few years ago. I, I've, I've heard since now he's torn these back two chambers down. But this was a hykirigama. Basically, it's an onagama chamber connected to a couple of, of uh, Naborigama chambers. It's, a, almost, it's a really a hybrid kind of a kiln. But uh, he, he, he's one of the people who studied with um, my brain over there, Christine. Uh, Mark, um, Mark Hewitt. Uh, and Mark Hewitt is probably the best known wood fired potter these days. He's really f kind of figured out the whole aesthetic of, of that kind of look of work and he, and he located in, in an area uh, that was intellectually uh, accepting of what he does. And he's, I mean, he has, a, he had like a 12 page write up in Smithsonian Magazine if you ever go back through archives and find out about it. It's, it's a pretty interesting character. But anyway, he trained with, with, uh, with Mark and his pots, oftentimes look like the people you train with. Um, so he was doing fairly basic forms. Uh, that was just showing the upper two chambers, but the inside of these things are like cathedrals. I just love the insides of, of how he did his arch forms. Uh, I know, I've known a lot of potters who did bricks as much as they could, and then they just poured castable to try to make up for that hard to, to fit area. Well, he fitted the bricks. I mean, he cut them and really made them work. The, it gets a little bit hard when you, when you start to step into the other chamber, and that's why I kind of showed that detail where you couldn't find the, bring that taper in anymore with bricks. He just stopped it, started over again, and had a seam there. Uh, that's just the opening of his kiln, and you can see he's a tall guy. So, and he could stand up inside his chamber, so they had to be seven, seven and a half feet high probably. Um, I'll do a little bit about, I'm going to go on a little bit about kiln building, and, I, and since I'm built to kilns, I'll be talking about mostly mine, I guess. Uh, this is a kiln I had down by, right on Route 116. It was my first Naburagama kiln, and I built it up on the cinder blocks. Um, yep. Basically, I didn't, I, already, I used to raise pigs, and I had a concrete slab because that was my pig pen, so I, I, I pour a concrete slab to start a kiln. So I started with with this, just because that's where, the, where my concrete slab was, and I built the hillside out of center blocks. So basically, firebox would go here, first chamber there, second chamber there, and then chimney on top. And that's sort of the layout for that, and the building of the arch form, which I'll, I'll talk about arch forms next. But that, that, that size kiln, I was actually able to build in about two weeks. That is a, that's the self-supporting catenary arch. And the, and the form is, is uh, determined by hanging from a, a chain, not a stream, because a chain has the ability to not to flow really evenly, hanging a chain from two points. And if the two points are the same width and height, all the thrust is straight down, and you have a self-supporting kiln. And that's sort of what catenary arches are. A lot of potters choose to build catenary arches because, boy, you talk about, you don't have to build a wall. You, I mean, when you build the thing, you, once you build the arch form, you've built the whole kiln. Um, there's pluses and minuses to it. To me, the minuses are, as you try to stack that up, your shelving gets tight, and it's, it, I find it a real nuisance. If, if they're really big, like, like some of the potters who have seven foot wide ones, that's, that's fine. But if you have the, like little four foot wide ones, pretty soon your shelves are in an odd spot and you're putting your post, if you know about stacking kiln shelves, you don't want to put a post right in the middle of the shelf below and put all the weight on there. It, it gets hard to kind of stack those. But that was the first wood kiln I'd built, and I used a double chambered one, and, and I learned right away how un, unstructurally sound they are. I built one wooden form, which was that, that arch form I showed how it was built, and I, and I built my first chamber out of that, and I thought, well, I'll, gonna, I'll just use the same form and build a second chamber. But I have to kind of be really close to this first one in the process. Well, it, this thing just move side to side without, without any structure to it. It had you know, no structural strength. It, it was self-supporting, but until I capped it, and what, what I ended up doing was I capped it with concrete to kind of create like an ectoskeleton so it wouldn't move this way. Uh, I had to do that before I could actually really you, reuse that form. Uh, but that kiln, this kiln, I used for about 12 years, I guess. 
I eventually built a building over it, and now if you drive by our house, there's just a barn down there, or a storage building down there. And I have a couple of raccoon kilns here, and then that was my pit kiln and my woodshed at the time. Um, that was in the early 90s. Um, and then uh, when I burned that kiln out, I decided I'd build a larger kiln, and one I could stand up in, I wouldn't have to be end over in, I wouldn't have to fire as often because it was driving me nuts loading and unloading and stacking doors and unstacking doors. So uh, I worked backwards from the kiln size shelves I had, which were two foot square. So I had a choice. I could either build a kiln that was two foot wide, which didn't make sense, or four foot wide because that's two shelves and four foot deep, which would have been okay, but I went three shelves that way. And then we were, we were just talking before about how much space you leave between shelves. And I've pinched my fingers and had troubles enough, and I want to get airflow through. So um, my chamber, the shelves are six feet. Uh, if you measured you know, all three shelves together, two, two, three two-footers, I actually have about seven and a half foot of depth to my kiln, because I, I leave space between the shelving and between the shelves and the walls of the kiln. And um, I'll, I'll run through a real quick layout of this. This was the, kind of the footprint I built, and I've never been great at doing blueprints. So for me, doing blueprints was laying bricks out, which it turns out to take a lot more time when you have a big kiln than a small kiln. Uh, that little, little one, it took two weeks. I thought, well, you know, I, I built a smaller one that, would, that was my salt kiln up the hill. That, okay, that took, us, that took us a couple of weeks as well. How long can this take? It could take a long time. It took me two summers in basically every spare minute I had when we didn't have customers. So this is essentially where my firebox is going to be, my first chamber, my second chamber. The, those flues would then feed into a chimney. Uh, and, I, and I'm building up now. These are the flues that will lead from the firebox into the first chamber. And you can see I've now determined between the uh, going into the chimney and between the, 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 the first glazing chamber and the chimney, I've now built that section of wall up. And you can see it's starting to take shape. There are things I did here that were, I wouldn't say nonsensical, but my love of architecture overwhelmed my good sense in that I could have put a lintel, one long brick across there and had a square hole, and boy, would that have been a lot easier. Uh, but something about arches I just kind of I'm in love with. And I actually had a, a good source of bricks from Canada that gave me these, these really big arch bricks that uh, I was able to throw these arches with. That made that was fairly easy. It was the fact that all the bricks have to die into that, have to be cut to fit against that. Um, and that's where you know, things started to become an issue. Uh, for those of you who aren't, haven't built kilns or don't know about you, I'll, I'll give a little bit about bricks, uh, sizes, durability, and insulation. Bricks come in basically all kinds of sizes. Most potters are familiar with what we in the kind of hobby studio potter world uh, call a nine by four and a half by two and a half. That's a pretty much of a standard brick for us. And so a four and a half, which is half of a nine, you can kind of stack it and you can end up with a nine inch wall. The two and a half inches doesn't make much sense actually. Industry has a three inch one, which then you know, converts perfectly. You can fire it all kinds of different ways, but that's, that's what most studio potters that we use is, use these nine by three and a half by four, nine by four and a half by uh, two and a half inch bricks. And my kiln's primarily built out of that. Um, and it really depends on what the bricks are being used for. So I'm talking about sizes right now, like for house construction, street paving, kiln building, there's every kind of brick you can imagine. Most people are familiar with straight looking bricks, either red house bricks or, or straight bricks that potters use. I'm often asked if I cut every brick for my arch or my kiln on I said, no, I would have killed myself if I had to do that. I mean, there are bricks that are made for arches. Um, as far as the durability and the insulation value of the bricks, it all has to do with density. A red house brick you know, is a good hard brick, but if you fired it to the temperature that we fire our kilns, it will turn to liquid. Uh, in fact, a lot of red clay you can find in riverbanks around here, you can turn it out into a liquid clay, dip your pot into it, and it makes a nice glaze. Um, so those bricks are only fired to somewhere in the vicinity of 1,700 to 1,800 degrees, and they're quite hard, quite dense, but they're, you know, you go to 2,400 and they turn to a liquid. Um, so the red house bricks are what everybody's common familiar with. Most potters are familiar with a white brick, which we call, you know, a, a, a hard refractory brick. 
Uh, they're not always white, but they tend to be white. A lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a lower iron content, iron being a flux, which would make the bricks melt at lower temperature. And then there's insulating fire brick, which is what the dream is of, of, in terms of insulation. That's what all electric kilns are built out of. They weigh nothing. You think you're holding styrofoam up. Uh, they're just great, great bricks. Unfortunately, because they're so porous, in wood kilns and in salt kilns, the sodium vapors penetrate into them and eat them from the inside out. So they don't have a, a great deal of, of longevity, but they're great insulation. Uh, like I said uh, they weigh about one tenth the weight of a hard brick, and the insulation value is literally 10 times of, of what a hard brick would be. And, then, and the bricks come in a variety of sizes. I won't get into all the different ones, but essentially, my archers on my kilns are composed of either a straight brick, which is, well, say, a nine by four and a half by two and a half, and then some variety of an arch brick, a one arch, a two arch, or a three arch. And if you, if you can tell, that taper basically gets more narrow as the number goes up. So a number three arch has a pretty steep taper. And when you have some kind of a form that you're putting bricks on, and again, I, I know there's mathematical ways of doing this, and there's books that tell you this, but I'm, again, more of a, like, I'll figure it out on the ground kind of guy. So I would build the arch form, and I just keep stocking up bricks of varying widths until they sort of made that form. And then I just made sure I wrote down what they were, and then I built the whole arch, you know, accordingly. Uh, so this is what I was saying before about the arches were a really cool idea, except that all these bricks had to be cut to die into that arch. I mean, you could have used a lot of mortar and filled in if you didn't want to, but somehow looks were important to me. So I ended up going through five diamond blades, which was an unexpected cost in building my kiln because each diamond blade was like 100 bucks. Um, not something I was thinking I was ever going to have to do, but a lot of bricks were... were harder to cut than others. The arch bricks over these flues, which I got from up in Canada, had 85% alumina content to them, which most hard bricks, when you're a potter and you look for super duty bricks or high duty, high duty bricks are what you get like a hardware store for the back of your, your uh, fireplace. Um, they have like 38% alumina or something. Super duty bricks have like between 42 and maybe 44% alumina. These had like 85% alumina in them. And to try to cut them with a diamond blade was just almost a joke. And you just sat there and watched the diamonds kind of wear away, eating through these bricks. Um, but, but, they, but they are super strong bricks. Uh, terrible insulation, but really strong. So I've now laid out the floor of my kiln. I actually, my, my walls are all 13 inches thick. The first nine inches shows here. I did a step back so that when I brick my doors in, the first layer of bricks locks in. I don't have a, a gap that goes all the way through. If you've ever hand bricked in door bricks, you know this sort of when you put them in at first, you're just going a brick against a brick. But if you can stagger that first one, now you can have a whole row of staggered bricks. And I actually made my doors about an inch wider than the bricks were because I could always stagger that joint. I have three courses of bricks to do it in. I could push that stagger back and forth. So I, didn't, I don't mud up my doors. I don't have to uh, with the way they, they tend to work. Sprung arches, as opposed to catenary arches, are, are, are a portion of a circle. If you drew a circle and you took any arc off that circle, that's essentially what would be a sprung arch. Uh, and they really need support because the thrust is going outward on that. And you need, these are called skewbacks, but you need something that's going to support that and you need to some kind of pressure to hold that in place. And, it, and in cathedrals, they call them flying buttresses. You see them coming off the sides of churches that hold those big domes up. Uh, most potters do it with steel work. Um, when I, I didn't know that much about, I mean, I'd built about 18 kilns before I built this big one of mine, um, but I thought it'd really be cool to build a, a barrel vault, which is essentially half of a circle. You know, if you took a circle in half, cut a barrel in half, you have this. And that's what you see when you see aqueducts, you see these barrel vaults, and they look so pretty. Uh, I built a wooden form, put it in place, loaded it up, got all the bricks in place, pulled it out, and it fell down. And I went, well, wait a second, I mean, know these things work. And then I started reading up in non-pottery books about barrel vaults. And they really are great under load weight. You put a ton of weight on top of them, trying to like break an egg with your hand. You know, the structure is there. But because they're so rounded, they want to kick out there, unless you put something on top and load them up. Uh, catenary arches, you don't have to do that with, because all the weight is sort of designed 
to be thrown straight down in it. So the kiln that I built, and actually I'm building an arch form there, is a modified, I'll call it a modified cat. I used half of the uh, height to the width. So my kiln is like seven foot wide. I went up three and a half feet instead of seven feet to, to form the arch form. So it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a sprung arch. It's not a barrel arch. It's kind of a modified cat. And that's, that gave me a lot more structure in terms of not worrying about outward thrust. So essentially, I hung a chain uh, on a piece of plywood. I spray painted that. They gave me a dotted line because I used a beaded chain. And I cut the wooden form for that, put some supports in it, and I'm screwing down masonite on top of that. And that became uh, the wooden form that I then used to stack my bricks on top of. Uh, unfortunately, I had already built a building, and I didn't have... Uh, I had posts in the way, so I couldn't put one big arch form in that I could put all the bricks on and pull out because it would hit something. So I could only build this thing three and a half feet wide. So what I've done here is I've, I've built this part of the arch, and when I stopped it, I, I filled, I'm, I'm doing what's called a staggered joint where every other brick is, is overlapping itself. I put a half brick in where they ended and then slid the arch form back and then basically sprung the arch down and then put, started another row on top of it. So I had to move the arch form three times in order to get the depth of that kiln put together. And I did put steel on there. Technically, I probably shouldn't have needed to, but I'm a belts and suspenders guy. No suspenders today, but usually a belts and suspenders guy. I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to you know, have the arch go anywhere. So that's it after I pulled the form. It's not quite like a, a, a portion of a circle. You can see it's, it's more peaked than that, but it's also not a true catenary arch. So I went up four feet with a straight wall and did the cat, the cat, modified cat on top, and I gave myself lots of headroom so I don't bang around in there. And then again, just to make life hard, I decided usually <laughs> you could just use the top of your arch of your kiln for you know, your doorway, but somehow an arch within an arch seemed to make so much sense and seemed to be so pretty. But that meant you then had to cut all these bricks to fit two different angles. So uh, it became a, kind of, a, again, I, I made, I made my, my own life difficult, but uh, I, I like the visual results at the end of it. When I got all done with it, uh, these, this arch basically, this, um, this is on the first chamber. Uh, I used a four and a half inch brick on the first chamber. This is basically a little facade brick. It's only four and a half inches. And just so when you're looking at the kiln, it looks like a brick. I put um, a, a coating of a fiber blanket, which is a high insulation, it depends on what temperature, but it's good for 2400 degrees. And then I put mono block, which is a cheaper insulation, on top of that. And then I put in some block wire on top of that. And then I put basically about an inch of concrete on top. So I kind of created an ectoskeleton on top of uh, my kiln, which kind of is like a turtle shell in a sense. You know, there, it, the, the, art, the bricks can expand and contract and the fiber blight can, can, can take that, but it also protects the whole arch on top, knowing that they can move. And I don't use any mortar in the kilns. They're all dry laid. So if the, they were mortared together, you could probably walk on top of the arch, but because they're not, there's, there can be side wobble to it. And I got rid of that by kind of creating a concrete shell on top of it. Uh, so that's sort of uh, the inside of the first chamber being done. And you can see this is why I couldn't use uh, one arch form that I could pull all the way out because I only had three and a half feet between the front of the kiln and where that post was. Um, just a, a couple of quickies on, on the big kiln that I have now. Um, there's about 10,000 bricks in the kiln, as it turns out. Um, and part of that was the fact that I decided to go with thicker walls. Uh, I'd always built kilns that had like nine inch walls. A lot of electric kilns have four and a half inch walls. Some electric kilns only had two and a half inch walls on them. But I decided to go with a full 13 inches, which meant just more bricks. And when you span them out over the number of, of length that this thing was, it ended up being a lot of bricks. Um, where the last chamber, the salt chamber exits, I had three flues. So I had three flues going between my firebox and my first chamber, three flues going between my first chamber and my salt chamber, and three flues exiting the last chamber. Um, by all logic, you should have put your chimney right there in a way, and it would have gone right up. But again, I already had the building, and it didn't kind of work to have the chimney there. So I kind of created kind of like a manifold on a carburetor, where I tapered uh, a variety of bricks to, to come into essentially a single flue, which would be the chimney. Uh, and I wanted to get an even draft coming from all three of those. 
So that's why that shape exists. And that got concreted over to kind of create, and I, was, I didn't use an arch, I basically did a corbel, if you know, a corbel is a way of kind of just stepping in bricks until you have an arch form on top of it. And I, I concreted over that, and then went up with a layer of bricks. And again, there's no, the only concrete in the kiln is an ectoskeleton, or in the case of these bricks, when I stacked the bricks up, um, I wanted to do a round chimney for a lot of aesthetics as part of it, I gotta admit. But I also saw a number of these things, and industrially, they draw better than a square chimney does, because the corners in a square chimney don't really help the draft gases vortex up, so round chimneys are actually kind of more effective anyway. Uh, and as, as I stacked these bricks, I, I stacked them dry. I, I did make up a mud of liquid clay just to sit the bricks on so they wouldn't, you know, wobble. Um, so they were sitting on liquid clay, but then that, when, I, when the inside of the bricks was touching, it left this big gap on the outside, and I just couldn't fill it with clay because it was exposed to the weather. So I actually used concrete, sacrete from the hardware store, and just threw it into those holes to kind of seal those up. It doesn't really hold the, kiln, the chimney together, but it does uh, uh, not melt when it rains. Um, so the kiln's now done. Uh, I've, uh, I have tie rods that connect the bottoms together, I actually have tie rods that will go across here, and there after I've stacked it and I put the door in to, to prevent any kind of outward expansion. In theory, it really wouldn't exp it, uh, have much expansion because this thrust is coming in to this thrust and they're pushing against each other. But when you get to the end, especially to the chimney end, there's really nothing there to support it unless I ran a big flying buttress off the back, and I didn't. So I did put heavy steel work on, on this. And uh, early parts of the firing, it's pretty smoky. Uh, I, I was working backwards from a kiln building, which is not the way to do things, because I would love to have had the kiln step up higher. I didn't have that 22 degree angle. I had this really flat angle, and I had to make up for that with drafting it with the chimney to pull the air. And at first, when you're trying to run fire from here, almost 30 feet to the chimney, it doesn't want to go very fast. You got to warm the chimney up somehow. Uh, I do know some potters who actually put a gas burner in their chimney just to get it warm to get a draft going. I find I get a fire going and it, you know, it's smoky for about four or five hours and then eventually the, you know, you'll start to get a draft going through it. Um, at, some, at, I, uh, at some stage, uh, I'm basically monitoring through spy holes. Uh, I, I have three heights, top, middle, bottom, front and back of each chamber. So I'm, I'm looking at least uh, six cone packs in each chamber for height uh, variation in temperature. And I try to adjust that temperature with uh, the kind of wood we fire with, that is uh, what species to some extent, hardwoods are denser, they don't burn as fast. Smaller diameter wood burns faster, so you get a, a different kind of flame. So, so small pieces of soft wood give you a quick, hot, long flame, uh, which m tends to go up into the arch, tends to heat the top of the kiln more. And if you want to slow things down, hard woods, bigger, bigger pieces, kind of burns with a shorter flame, tends to heat the bottom of the kiln more. Uh, obviously, you can adjust the damper and air intakes as well, but, but species of wood and sizes of wood are a big part of that. And uh, we were firing, and I, I was talking to some folks earlier about my firing cycle. I, I was a little late in life building a kiln this big. Most of the people I'm meeting who had these big onagamas were in their 20s, and they had a whole long time ahead of them to be firing them. I was in my 50s when I built them, in my 60s now, I'm going, what was I thinking about? Uh, uh, I, I, I'm glad I have it now, but I wouldn't start it probably building one again at this size. Um, but the problem with the really big kilns is they do take a certain amount of time to fire. I fired this in the shortest 28 hours, but I didn't get good even heating results. Just the, the pots didn't sit long enough. I got everything melted, but kind of uneven as, 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 as could be. So I've extended it out to about 40 hours seems to be optimal for me. But that means you're stoking day and night for 40 hours. And uh, that's been a real issue is finding stokers. So if anybody likes to stay up all night and <laughs> wants to leave their name, we have a book here uh, of I'm looking for all night stokers. Um, like from midnight to six is the shift that's the hardest to fill. Um, 
But uh, my firebox is six foot long. We usually have two people stoking at a time. One person opens the firebox door, the other person slides in three pieces of wood that's about six foot long. I'm burning mostly spruce, hemlock, pine. Um, and I, again, because my firebox door is very high, not because it needs to be, in fact, it shouldn't be, it should be lower in order to, to drive the fire into the next chamber, but I didn't want to bend over. And I didn't have the ability to step down the ground the way I mentioned uh, uh, Bruce Martin had done in, in New Zealand, which would have been a great idea. I actually thought about jackhammering the concrete and building down, but that, that idea kind of didn't last too long. Uh, so I basically built my firebox about three foot higher than it needed to be. So when you open a firebox door, you tend to get this back pressure at first. It only lasts for about uh, 10 seconds, but it's, a, it's quite a treat when it happens. Um, I actually take a couple sections of roofing off every time I fire because there is a lot of smoke in the building and that's what I've done there. I actually just unscrewed the roof, slid it over, and then held it in place with a couple of boards so I could slide it back after each firing is done. And towards the end of the firing, when I'm firing the back chamber, and you're closer to the chimney when you're stoking the back chamber, uh, the first 30 hours and five cords of wood heats the first chamber up to uh, a maximum temperature. The back chamber, uh, you're, you're you know, 12 feet closer to the chimney at that point. So when you're stoking the back chamber, you start to get what they call a dragon's breath out the, out the top because it, the flames are basically 40 or 50 feet long. And then when they come up and they finally, all these unburned gases actually hit the oxygen, they'll combust and you'll have like smoky kind of gas at first and then flames will shoot up for a few seconds. And it's kind of, it's pretty cool to watch, but uh, it's, uh, you know, not why you fire the kiln. Um, that's just looking into the firebox. I, I, I sort of designed my firebox so that I could actually look into the first chamber and see what was going on so I could see if there was, uh, the, if the coal pile would burn evenly one side or the other. It's pretty hard to see when you're stoking at first. And this is toward the end of, of the firing uh, where we're actually stoking, the, the reason I threw the shot in, we're actually stoking the back chamber and that's what's giving us the dragon's breath. It's toward the end of the firing. Uh, so that's at the end of the firing, we've, and I'll unbrick the doors. My doors are built entirely out of insulating fire brick, which are those really light bricks. Uh, I do that because insulating fire bricks are actually cut bricks as opposed to slop molded. They weren't kind of made in a mold and then dry kind of, they, most bricks are pretty even, but, but insulating fire bricks are actually cut. They're really perfectly sized. So when you stack them up, you end up with just really beautiful bricks. Um, it, they wear out, and the ones facing the fire side wear out pretty quickly. So I'm rotating. I'm kind of, you know, I, I dip bricks after each firing into a, a wash of aluminum hydrate, almost like kiln wash, uh, to help prevent so much penetration. And then after a couple of firings, I'll flip them one side to the other, so the other side's getting hotter. And then when they start to start to look like they're going to shrink on me, I move them one course in. So they're kind of getting moved out toward the outside layer with three courses of them. You know, it would take me about 10 years before I've worn out all my door bricks. There's about 320 uh, insulating bricks in each door. And that, that's coming out of the salt chamber. Actually, I think that pot is over there. Um, uh, and that, that basically, it's just finishing up. I mean, I'm really firing kilns for effects, and that's essentially why uh, uh, I've got seven kilns at my place now instead of just one kiln. And uh, the uh, types of kilns that we're firing with are, you know, have, for me, have really moved to the wood salt world. And um, I just want to give credit to my wife who, who you know, I, I keep saying I, I, I. I happen to be the potter in the family, but this would not happen. I could never run a pottery without it being a two-person operation. And between Chris answering the phone, talking to people, uh, kind of shielding me from a lot of things I want to be shielded from sometimes, uh, I'd never get anything done. And uh, it's the two of us that run this, the showroom together. So I, I thank you all for coming. And um, I know I ran long. So if anybody has questions.
I mean, I probably said way too much. <laughs> what are your thoughts on your first kiln I saw you build back in 1970, oh. 71? Yeah, yeah. It had a uh, simple yeah. frame. Yeah, I didn't, know, I didn't know how to build an arch then. So basically. But, but was that, would that be a good hobby type? Thing? Oh, yeah, they work good. A lot of people don't. And you see those in, in books a lot. Basically, you can take insulating fire bricks, get like a one inch speed bore bit, drill holes in them. You know, and get a, a row of them, put a three-quarter inch metal rod through it, and just sit it on top of a wall, and you have a flat roof. It, they actually work. My first two kilns were that way because I didn't know how to build an arch. So I built one, when we were talking about was at UVM, right? That was in 71. And then I moved to Moortown, and I had one in, in Irisville for a year that was a flat arch, and I had one in Moortown that was a flat arch. By the time I got to uh, Bristol in 73, I, I moved to Arches. And uh, they really do work. I mean, you don't have to worry about the rod melting and, and, the, and the roof falling that, that's in. That's the problem, right? That, well, that is what you would think it would be the problem with them. I, I've, I've seen, I have friends who have kilns, and they've fired them for years that way, where the bricks broke and they fell in. They only had this much insulation between there and the, and the rod, and they got through the firing okay. And some of them will actually put pressure on the sides, which holds what, what the bricks together as they crack. But that's not what I tend to do. So there's, there, there's not, go ahead. Hey, Bob. Um, I took a workshop with uh, Stephen Hill, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with, oh, sure. who has totally changed his philosophy about fire, going from cone 10 reduction, uh, wood or gas, right. and salt, to oxidation, cone 6, for all the environmental reasons. Primarily, from his estimation, there being just such incredible changes to glaze chemistry in the last, let's say, 10 to 20 years that he can replicate in oh. an oxidized cone six uh, electric kiln what he had been creating otherwise. Oh, no question about it. I mean, I mean, technology has changed so much. I mean, we you know, any any of us who come out of the '60s era of making pots, you know, you made your own kiln because that's what you did. You, you made your own clay because that's what you did, and you made your own clay tools and your own potter's wheel because that's what you did. There's so much new stuff out now and, and so much more refinement in the mineral world where you can add, you know, uh, you know, carborundum powder to your glazes and get copper reds in, in electric kilns, which is, you know, amazing kind of stuff to my mind that can happen. I just haven't made that. I, I, I still like the, the participation of fire and it, it has really little to do with economics. I mean, if I was 20 years younger, I would be basically not doing what I'm doing. I mean, I, I wanted to do this before I, I, I was past being able to do this. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to the next, you know, 10 years of wood firing or so. But from a business standpoint, ooh, you know, it's, you know, electric makes a lot of sense. And now that there's programmable electric kilns, crystalline glazes, I mean, even people with electric kilns 20 years ago, you know, you still had to really kind of control what was going on now with, with, with all these controls you can have on, you can make crystalline glazes almost for sure, you know, using, you know, uh, computer uh, controlled electric kilns. So, yeah, the world's different. Have you ever thought about, uh, like, cone six um, salt? I know a lot of people are trying to... Yeah, you can. I mean, I, 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 what, what tends to happen is how many different temperature ranges do you want to work in? And for me, for my glazing, at least, I wanted, I wanted to... Uh, just hold with one kind of glaze. And I basically, I'm basically trying to fire like a cone nine, nine, 10 glaze, which, just, which will go to 12 without too much problems and looks okay at eight, eight and a half. You know, I could make the switch down to cone six, but at this point in my life, I'm, I'm just a little late to start on that one. And it, especially with wood firing, it doesn't make much difference. I mean, you know, the difference between getting to cone eight and getting the cone 11 in the wood kiln is, you know, not that much more wood and that, not that much more time to bother with. Uh, I can see with electric kilns and maybe gas kilns, yeah, you don't want to spend the extra money and you don't see the look in it anyway. Uh, and you see that uh, without getting too much on the sidetrack, bone china, which is not porcelain, 
but bone china, which really looks like porcelain, is just as dense as porcelain is. And they figured out ways of fluxing the clay bodies down to where they were just as dense as porcelain was, but, uh, but are fired at a much lower temperature. So there's, the industry's figured out all the, all the ways to, to cut costs. Uh, most of us aren't doing this for economic reasons. We should be, but, but most of us aren't. You know. How often do you fire the big kiln these days? Well, that depends on the economy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I fired twice a uh, year before last. I didn't fire last year, and I, it looks like I'm not going to fire this year. Having said that, I'll fire my gas kiln multiple times. Uh, in a, what I love making for pots and what sells the best, I mean, doing this retrospective has been a, a, a great thing for me, and I, I, I'm forever grateful for Frog Hollow for having a shot at it, because it's one chance I, I had to put a lot of work out that I borrowed, had to borrow back from people because I didn't even own. But, but looking at what I did in the 70s, looking at what I did in the 80s, is really different than what I'm doing today. And the logic of what I did then made a lot of sense at that point in time. And the logic of, of the water sculptures made a lot of sense at the time that I was doing them. And the marketing devices that we were using, working through agents and, and finding sources for that. The kind of stuff I'm doing now really comes a lot more from, from here rather than here, which is not the way you should probably live your life if you really want to be economically viable. But, uh, but the results I get out of the firing process is I just, you know, uh, I, I say, I've, I've said to many people, you know, I get maybe 1,200 pots in the, in the big wood kiln, and I'm really happy if I get 60 to 80 out of 1,200. If I get 60 to 80 real gems out of it, I'm thrilled. I mean, I don't mean that the rest of them are terrible, but to get those are just like, what the hell happened there? I mean, I, you know, I was just, you just, you, you hope for that, but you, you can't guarantee it. And the more wood potters I've met, uh, the more I realized that that's kind of reality, because I always thought, oh God, they're such good wood potters, they always come out with all these great pots. And you know, when you look in magazines and you see the, these wonderful pots that these people make, you know, Stephen Hill, you know, you know they're out different, uh, what's, what's, what's the red, uh, copper red guy, is uh, Tom Coleman? Is that who Tom, I mean, even Tom doesn't get copper reds out of every firing that he does, even though you know, he's sort of noted for it. Um, the same thing, I've, I've heard the same thing with wood-fired potters. It's like most of them find, you know, the percentage of, of all pots coming out is much lower than you get out of gas and way lower than you get out of electric, where you have more the, more the consistency of temperature and oxygen and, and, and uh, atmospheric conditions. But if you're looking for that gem, it's like mining for coal looking for diamonds. You know, you do find them occasionally, and that's, that's sort of where my, my head's at these days. So your, your disappointment is in a, an expectation or a hope you had going into the firing. Then there's a total randomness, I guess is fair yeah. to say. Yeah. And um, I mean, I guess I, I'd like you to define what's, tell me about a bad one in the kiln. What's, a, a what bad makes fire? a bad one a bad one? Oh, uh, well, for, well I, I might, my bad ones have changed. Um, <laughs> bad ones used to be, I overfired everything trying to get the kiln hot enough for where the, the lowest temperature pots were not making the temperature. And the glaze ran off and, and you, th you threw 20% of your pots on the dump because they just ran off the sides of the pots or they pooled in the bottom and they were just junk. Um, and the more I've been wood firing now, the more I'm finding that uh, I fire to what I see as being a reasonably uh, a reasonable percentage of, of the kiln is at the temperature I want it to be, whether it's front, top, box, so it doesn't really matter. I fire for that range, and if it means some of the pots are going to be underfired, so be it. I'm finding that uh, what I and I have learned this again, not from everybody, and not every wood fire potter who's well known does this. But more and more, the wood fire potters I'm meeting are saying that they refire a lot of their wood pots in their gas kiln, and I'm one of them. I mean, I'm finding now that uh, we get what's called late ash in the kiln. You know, you, you, you fire. I finished off the fire, the first chamber. You know, I got a pretty, pretty even, say, cone 10 and a half everywhere. It looks like things are going to be great. I stopped stoking the kiln. Well, there's still wood in the firebox. It didn't disappear. So that wood is burning down, and as it burns down and, and the ash is being pulled into that first chamber, unless it's really filtered somehow, which is pretty hard to do, but it is doable to some extent, that ash is hitting these pots as they turn the taffy. They do it from molten glass to kind of a taffy stickiness. And now you have the dry ash hitting pots. And what had been a beautiful pot now 
has like a concrete gritty surface to it. And you're looking at it going, this is a beautiful pot, but it's like concrete. Uh, those I refire, and, I, and I've gotten my very best pots now out of wood-fired pots that had laid ash on them that I then refired in my gas kiln because my gas kiln cools slower than my wood kiln does, and I end up getting like some crystals growing in there as well as melting out the wood ash. So I, you know, it's a, it's a okay, now three firings instead of two, but, uh, but you know, if you get the results out, that's all that matters. And again, I may, I may got the numbers, but out of 1,200 pots, I get 50, 60 really just, they're just everything I wanted out of them. There'll be another 100, 150 that, ah, I got to refire. And, uh, and out of the refires, I get pretty high success rate, probably 70% of the refires are either good or really good. Um, and then you end up with all the common pots, which is really kind of what we mostly sell in our studio. Uh, I mean, they're not bad pots, but they're just not gems. Uh, and a lot of potters, John Leach, if you know John Leach's work at all, his work is pretty much just exterior raw clay with some flashing on it. I mean, they're not like, you know, they're, they're simple pots. And uh, I'm, I'm, I've been looking for more glaze effects, which is maybe not something that I, you know, should anticipate getting high, high success rates out of if that's what I'm looking for. And, um, and that's why, you know, like I say that third firing seems to be the gem for me. Thank you. Thank you.